So the opening poem to Songs of Experience, uh, published in 1794, um, Blake published, well, created Songs of Innocence in 1789, and then he published Songs of Innocence along with Songs of Experience in uh, 1794. The opening poem to Songs of Experience is, is, is pairs nicely with the opening poem to Songs of Innocence. The Songs of Innocence open up with a kind of shepherd poet who has a pipe and responds to this muse-like child. Uh, he plays instrumental music, he plays music with words, and he writes the words down in a book. We have a different kind of poet in, at the opening of Songs of Experience. Um, the, 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 the poem opens, much more complicated diction, uh, a much rougher rhyme scheme, um, a much rougher rhythm as well. Hear the voice of the bard, He's like command. Hear the voice of the bard, versus piping down the valleys wild, piping songs of pleasant glee. Hear the voice of the bard, who past, present, and future sees, whose ears have heard the holy word that walked among the ancient trees, culling the lapsed soul and weeping in the evening dew that might control the starry pole and fallen, fallen light renew. So this is a poet that's very aware of time, the past, the present, and the future, as opposed to the poet who's very attuned to the immediate moment in, in, in innocence. And the, the historical sweep of this bard uh, has put this bard um, actually in the Garden of Eden, where he hears the holy word that walks among the ancient trees. This sounds like the presence that walks among the trees in the cool of the evening in the Garden of Eden, as described in the Bible. And... What does this holy bard do? Um, well, we don't quite know. Listen to the syntax here. I'm going to read a little bit of it again. Hear the voice of the bard who, passed, who present, past, and future sees, whose ears have heard the holy word that walked among the ancient trees, calling the lapsed soul and weeping in the evening dew. Calling the lapsed soul can modify either uh, the holy word, um, which could be God, which could be Jesus, or it could modify the bard. So, we, there, there, there is syntactical ambiguity here. It's simply impossible for us to decide one way or the other. So already this poem has a kind of um, complexity and ambiguity that we do not see in um, Songs of Innocence. So this bard is basically calling earth to rise up. Earth has fallen. Um, it's benighted. But earth can rise up and have light and can control the stars, whereas now Earth feels constrained by the stars. The, um, by the stars. Now, unlike Songs of Innocence opening, where we just have one voice, here we have two voices. And so Earth answers, and Earth seems to misunderstand this bard entirely. She raises up her head from the darkness, dread and drear. Um, her light fled, stony dread, her locks covered with gray despair. She says, no, I am prison on the watery shore, and starry jealousy keeps my den. Um, cold and o'er, weeping o'er, I hear the father of the ancient men, selfish father of men, cruel, jealous, selfish fear. Candle lights chained in night, the virgins of youth and morning bear. Does spring hide its joy when buds and blossoms grow? Does the sower sow by night? Or the plowman in darkness plow? So this is not the same bard that we saw in the first part of the poem. This bard is saying, hey, earth, get up, redeem yourself. You, you have the light right now. You're not controlled by the stars. You can control the stars right now. But instead, earth here is a kind of vengeful god, um, a god who wants to keep earth chained, a god that wants to keep earth repressing her sexual desires. Her, her sensual urges. So how do we make sense of this gap between what the bard clearly says, this message of hope and redemption, and how earth hears what the bard says? So Blake's ideas of God are always psychological. Um, when Blake talks about God, he's not making theological statements. Um, Blake is interested in God insofar as God is a manifestation of how we feel about ourselves. So think of it this way. If I'm someone who doesn't want to take on the responsibility of freedom, if I'm someone who is afraid to create my own system, if I'm someone who is afraid to follow my whims and my fancies, then I might believe in a God that keeps me from doing these things so I don't have to feel guilty for not doing them. 
I believe in a God who doesn't want me to follow my whims. I believe in a God who doesn't want me to follow my sensual urges. I believe in a God who doesn't want me to create a system, but just to adhere to his system. So this seems to be what Earth in this poem is doing. Um, she is afraid of living a life of light and creativity because, of course, that requires great courage and risk-taking and a willingness to take responsibility for your mistakes. Instead of living that sort of life, she imagines a God who forbids her to live that kind of life. So she relinquishes responsibility, which seems to be negative, but in doing so, she gains the positive, perversely, of being able to say, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. I have a tyrannical God who's making me behave a certain way. So we see how in experience, Blake moves into much more complicated epistemological terrain and asking us to think about gods or a God as a manifestation of our own fears and desires. Now, just very, very briefly before I end this video, um, you can look at the um, title page it's to my left of Songs of Experience. And again, you can look at this on the Blake Archive. But you'll see here that the children who were sort of bent over looking at the nursemaid's book in the title page of Songs of Innocence um, are here seemingly grown up, and they're looking down at two old people who appear to be dead, uh, whereas we have lots of wispy, curly, natural growth in Songs of Innocence opening um, image. Here we have lots of, of symmetry, straight lines, a kind of classical form. So we see here already in the world of experience this idea that Earth expresses, that we're in a world of lines, we're in a world of geometry, uh, we're in a world uh, of stasis, where we look at dead things. And even though this seems horrific, Earth in this poem seems to say, well, that's not really so bad, uh, because again, I don't want to take the risk and have the courage required um, for living uh, what Blake would call the creative life.